All right, everybody, let's get going. My name is Andrew. Uh, I'm going to be the MC for all four hours of lightning talks this afternoon, which is my punishment, I guess, for, um, for having told Brett Solomon that I would do whatever he wanted. And he said, okay, I've got just the thing. So this is actually going to be, this is a fantastic session. We have five really, really incredibly interesting talks, great speakers. Um, I've been Googling all of these people all morning, and I couldn't be more excited to have them here. The way we're going to run it is we've got five talks, 75 minutes, with transitions. That means I've asked um, the lightning speakers to keep it to about 13 minutes. Um, so uh, we'll try to get through all five talks on time. Um, instead of doing Q&A, though, I'm just going to encourage everyone here to come up afterwards, meet the speakers, talk to them directly, get to know them. Uh, we're not going to take time to do either intros because you can look people up online, or Q&A because you should get to know them personally. So with no further ado then, our first talk uh, is called Eurochild, Opportunities and Risks, Harnessing the Digital World to Facilitate Meaningful Participation Among Children in Europe. Please welcome Perna and, and I forgot to write down your name. Oh, and Tina, please come up. Hello. Yes, this works, right? It works? Yeah? Hello, everyone. My name is Tina. The Tina. We are from Eurochild. I don't know if you've all heard of Eurochild before, but we are a, a, a child rights based organization. We're based here in Brussels, but we have members across Europe in three, 33 countries. Uh, our membership is currently 178 organizations, so, and they all have that in common that they work for and or with children um, and fight for the rights of children. Yeah? Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Perna Hampal, Perna, which means inspiration in Hindi. Um, so I'm the head of communications at Eurochild. I've been there for two years, and we do some really interesting work, but nothing unlike you guys. I think we are in a sea of technologists and developers. So we're slightly, you know, the out outsiders, but I hope that we can get a lot of input from you all today or in the next few days. So, shall I begin? Okay, all right. So, I wanted to have a big rope here and uh, show you a little tug of war because there is a tussle. There's a tug of war of sorts in the arena of children's rights. But in this game, the aim is not to win by pulling the cord or the rope on one side or the other, but it's about keeping it in the middle. It's about finding a balance. So. The UN Convention on the Rights of Children, which is the basis of all of our work, recognizes the importance for all children under 18 years to be able to access and share information and exercise freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, meet and join groups. On the other hand, children also have rights to protection from harmful materials, from violence and abuse, and from sexual and economic exploitation, all of which can potentially be threatened in the online environment. And therein lies a tension between the children's right to protection and children's right to participation. So what's the state of children's online engagement? So in 2014, 68% of young people aged 9 to 16 years in Europe used social network sites. We know that has definitely gone up in the time being. So a high majority of overall EU population use internet and they have broadband connections at home. 60% um, of 9 to 16 year olds go online every day or almost every day. And more and more of them are using technology on their phones, uh, on their smartphones, sorry. 41% of European 9 to 16 year olds have encountered one or more of online risks. So that could be, they've, uh, for instance, they've seen sexual images, they've received nasty or harmful or hurtful messages or other harmful content, which could be pro-hate, uh, pro-anorexia, self-harm, drug taking, or suicide. This is based on a study of 25 European countries, and we can tell you more about it if you want to know more details about this study. Parental guidance, which is often used as a safety mechanism um, and recommended by a lot of policies and uh, guide, guidelines, is unfortunately incomplete or patchy. So the use of filters, for instance, is actually abysmally low. Uh, in the UK, Almost 70% of parents believe their children who are aged 12 to 15 know more about internet than they do. And that's not a surprise, right? And yet we believe that parental consent is, you know, a helpful measure. 
So keeping uh, that in mind, what's um, the Europe, what are the European institutions doing? So we work a lot with the EU institutions, Council of Europe as well. What are they doing in terms of policies? So they've recognized that the practical challenges of balancing children's right to protection and children's right to participation requires some efforts that they need to put down something down on paper. So they, along with the contribution of uh, industry and civil society, like us, um, are trying to make the internet more age aware and hopefully more child friendly. So the Council of Europe's new five-year strategy on the rights of the child has five strands, and one of which is the child's right to uh, rights of children in the digital environment. So they, they do recognize that this is an important space for them to understand how to protect children's rights. So your child is in fact right now, uh, my colleague who was supposed to speak with us, she's actually in a meeting today uh, at a committee where they're going to be deciding on guidelines for how to protect children in, the, in these kinds of situations. And those guidelines will be finalized by the end of this year. Now I'm sure you all know the, the big mammoth uh, GDPR. If I say GDPR, how many know what that means? Yeah, okay. So basically that's the big uh, regulation that the EU is putting forward, which is the EU General Data Protection Regulation. And that's something that we're looking at uh, just, we've just basically begun to look at it. So we're not lobbying on this, on this uh, regulation at the moment, but we do recognize that it has, it has severe practical implications for us as professionals, for children, and for anybody else who works with or for children. So what does this potentially, this GDPR mean for children? I think there are a few positive developments if you look at it. So firstly, it calls for transparent communication in a concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible form using plain and clear language. So basically, it's saying that language that should be used in relation with children should be child-friendly. And that's extremely important for us to be able to engage children. So it also ensures a very important right to be forgotten. This is something that I think a lot of possibly uh, organizations here might be involved in. <coughs> the tricky bit is the use and processing of data. So one of the aspects that the GDPR is talking about is verified parent con parental consent required for under 16. So some experts say that this could, this would be like if when we were teenagers, we would go to the library and we would have to ask our parents permission to take out a book. Would that be okay for you? I don't know. So that's one of the challenges that is coming up here. So this is also a tricky clause because, what it, um, because it allows countries in the EU to select minimum age from 13 years to 16 years, creating disparity of rule between countries. So what it means is one country, for instance, Belgium, could choose to put down a minimum age of 13 years, whereas France could say 16 years. How, how, will, um, you know, how, how will companies be able to manage this difference? And what does that mean in terms of creating a disparity between rules and creating, does it create an online boundary online? Um, that's something that I think we're gonna have to try to under, understand in the next few months. And then finally, what about the limits it would put on teenagers' opportunities for participation in a creative, educational, and civic activity online? So do we have a way of measuring opportunity costs for children who are not able to access um, these facilities online? Are we measuring those? And I think we'd like to hear from you if, if you are involved in research of this kind. So the GDPR is a reflection of uh, this tension that sits at the heart of children's rights. It aims to increase the protection for children using age limits and parental consent, but it also recognizes the need for transparent language and the right to be forgotten. And it is expected to impact the work of digital industry, governments, teachers, parents, and children's rights advocates like ourselves. So that's something that we'll be looking forward to in the next few months. And I think uh, we're also going to be talking about what this means for children's rights advocates like us. Yes. As you can see on the slide, my role within Eurochild is child participation and network development. But it's the child participation part that brings me here today. We, as we said, are a child rights based organization. We fight for children's rights, but we are also very focused on fighting with the children and listening to what children actually have to say so that we can take their voices forward, but not our voices on their behalf. 
Um, for this reason, we are now developing our first child participation strategy. Well, it's actually been developed and will hopefully be adopted next week at our General Assembly. And as a part of that, this child participation strategy, we are setting up national forums within the countries that we work in where children are working on a national forum and then they appoint a person that is a part of a European forum or a Europe, or Eurochild's Children's Council, as we call it. And what we are facing now, we've been, so we've been working with children in the past few months to develop this, this child participation strategy and we'll be now working with a new group of children. And what we are facing is this constant, um, challenge to, to figure out what is the best way of, of communicating with them. How, how far can we go in our communications with them online? How far can we go and contact them directly without contacting their parents? And on a European level, like we're working on, obviously most 98% of the communication happens online. So where are our limits? Can we use Facebook? How far can we use Facebook? Are there other social media tools? These are the questions that we're asking ourselves and these are the inputs that I'm hoping that if, for some of you, you're thinking, oh, I've got the perfect solution for you. And if you do, then please come and talk to me afterwards because I really want to hear that. Um, we're facing the issue, for example, of in our development group for the participation strategy, we have 11 children. They, 10 of them, have been fighting that they want to communicate through Facebook. And that is their means of communication because they say, we go on Facebook every day. That is where it's always easiest to reach us. Why don't we do it there? But we have one person that is 11 years old. So by law, she's not allowed to have a Facebook page. So there's also this balance that we need to create where we can obviously not exclude her from the group, but at the same time, we need to take into account what they actually want and what they, how they want to move forward. So these are the challenges that we're facing within this strategy. These are the challenges that we will be facing um, now that we're setting up this European group of, of children. Um, this group will be for children down to 12 years old in the beginning, so 12 to 18 year olds. So we are talking about older children here. But as we move forward, we are hoping to, to reach younger children as well. And obviously that, that gives us a whole new uh, bag of challenges because uh, six-year-olds might be very difficult to reach online. Um, so we would welcome any suggestions, any ideas that you potentially have on this issue. Come and find us or take down our email addresses and, and email us if you have any, any inputs. Just final point. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to raise is kind of the, where is the research for, that would help us build our practical knowledge on these issues. So there are some gaps that we'd like to raise here that we hope will, will give you some inspiration for the future. So in terms of the research focus, it's often, as, as Tina pointed out, it focuses on young people rather than younger, uh, on, on children. So what does that mean for if, if we want to engage with younger children with below the age of 12, for instance? In addition, there is limited disaggregation by gender. children who are vulnerable to harm offline are often equally vulnerable, if not more, online. So how can we make efforts so that we can focus more precisely on supporting these children? We don't have enough evidence about the needs of children, for instance, uh, children with disabilities and their uh, access to the internet. Now, uh, last two points maybe. Uh, are there other approaches apart from age limits, I think I mentioned this, uh, to build a practical policy? that could be a bit more nuanced. Uh, there are some experts who believe that age limits can be very arbitrary. You have one age for drinking, one age for driving a scooter, another age for accessing online environments. So what is the real basis for it? And how are you caging it to the specific child? And children mature in different ways as well. So how do you recognize that approach? Uh, how can we be more nuanced in this to allow them to Get, get the information and let them feel the responsibility that they are, can access online services, for instance. And finally, parental consent, as we mentioned before, is, is another question. How do we actually uh, recognize it as an authoritative way of, of ensuring protection if parents themselves don't feel comfortable about the internet, right? So we're looking forward to answering these questions, and uh, whether you're a human rights advocate, an industry head, a startup, Whatever you may be, I think you cannot ignore children and young people. They're voracious consumers. 
they in fact probably find you innovative use of, of your own technology. So you cannot ignore children and young people. And yet we are also possibly aware of the rapidly evolving technological developments and the potentially inadvertent uh, risks and challenges that those create. So we hope we're hoping to be working together with all of you and hope to see you soon. Um, I have first became aware of Sarawak Report uh, last year. I was working um, at Medium, and all of a sudden we got this note that Medium was uh, blocked in Malaysia, uh, and had been blocked in China before that, but that was the only country. That's normal for a speech platform. And then all of a sudden we got a blocking order uh, from Malaysia. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I used to. Uh, and so anyway, I started to learn about Sarawak Reports, and I couldn't be more excited about this talk. It's an incredible site. It's having a huge political impact. Uh, fighting corruption and tracking down um, the flows of money in and out of places it shouldn't go in Malaysia. So, to you, Christian Nola. Can I have um, to slide some, please? So, hi. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm Christian. I'm from Sarah Report. Um, so, slightly the wrong. Do I have a clip as well? Sorry. Uh, so, Sarah Report is a website, or well, it's a bit more than that nowadays. Um, we are, in essence, a very small setup. We are three people. Uh, there is a journalist called, you might have heard of, called Claire Rucasa Brown, who writes all the stories. And there's myself, who look after everything online. And then we also have a research slash social media assistant as well. So, we are tiny in the comparison of other organizations. Uh, right. So, we started in 2011. And back, actually before that, just worth pointing out to those who don't know, Sarawak is a state in Malaysia. So that's really kind of the starting point here. And the website started out basically dealing with issues in Sarawak about corruption, about money laundering, about logging. So it all started with the idea that basically there's a huge amount of deforestation going on. That was the starting point. And Sarawak report would cover issues around how come, what's happening here, who's doing it, who's ending up with the money. So this is what the, the scale is slightly wrong, you can't quite see it, but this is what the website looked back in 2011, um, actually 2010, I think. And it used to basically cover local issues, really hyper-local stuff, and it slowly evolved over time to something slightly more evolved. Um, the site then became a bit of a thorn in the side of the uh, government, let's put it that way, which I think is a mild understatement. But um, we started becoming a bit of an issue for them, and they then went out of their way to hire some PR agencies in Europe to set up sites that would write against us. So they set up a bunch of sites. One of them was uh, Sarah Reports with an S. That's the one in the top left. You can't quite see that, unfortunately. With an S. So they were trying to cheat our audience into thinking they were somehow, I don't know, authorities writing about us. So they would write against us with an S. And then on our site, like the new ledger as well, would also write stories against us. And we couldn't quite work out what was happening here and where was all this coming from. Who was, first of all, who was paying for it as well. So during the 2011 state election, we, were, we came under significant DDoS attacks and we were down for weeks on time. And obviously all this kind of stuff, anybody who's familiar with it is, uh, it takes, you know, it's expensive to run these campaigns and we were down for a week, if I remember correctly. Um, and after the election, suddenly our site came back online, everything was fine again. And we were like, well, this is all a bit interesting. And for me, as a designer, developer, we were like, this, I've never done a product before which had had any impact like this. And they're like, wow, this is exciting. You know, people really don't like us. And I was like, this is great. You know, we're obviously touching a really sore point. We must be doing something right. So uh, Claire, who writes all the stories, did some digging around, and after a while we found out that there was an agency called FBC Media, who were doing most of the uh, attacking for us. And FBC Media was based um, literally, I think, a kilometer from my studio by accident, which was quite interesting. FBC Media had in their client sort of uh, clientele, they, had, they were doing stories for the BBC, they were doing stories for CNN. And in the end, the BBC had to go out and do a worldwide apology saying, we're really sorry, we basically been broadcasting content that was paid for by Malaysian state, which is illegal. FBC eventually went bankrupt, they're no longer around, and they, you know, they are completely off, they're basically no longer, yeah. Uh, 
And as part of all this, it was just like interesting that we had all these organizations who were, could go and spend so much money against a tiny entity like our own. And it just sort of showed us like just the power of what a simple website can do online. And again, this is before people started doing mobile apps, this before, start, well, not quite before, but before people, before the mobile web really took off. So I was kind of hooked on the project. You know, we were, everybody was really devoted. This was, we were onto something really interesting here. And so we developed it onwards. So we obviously, the site developed, we started doing mobile. If I, was, if I remember correctly, we were one of the first sites in Malaysia to really go mobile first as well. And nowadays, I think we're doing like 80% is mobile. Though the 80% who actually get there, because I'll get to that a bit later, because um, it's a tricky site to find these days. Um, so the site developed, I became really interested in like thinking how can we, how can the design of the site also impact people? How can we attract more traffic and that kind of thing? Because it's not just, the journalist I work with, she's not necessarily terribly interested in design. And I always thought this is a really key component to any kind of news organization. Things have to look good if you want to be taken seriously. So I spent a lot of time and thinking about how that could work. Um, moving on, other little, just to mention a couple of other side products that we've been running as well. So as parallel to all this, we ran, uh, we're still running, a radio station that's called Radio Free Sarawak, which broadcast online and on shortwave as well. So the radio station broadcast in the local language IBAN, and uh, it, the idea was that it was gonna shortwave reaches straight into the people who don't have any internet access, and online you get to everybody else. So with two strokes you pretty much get the, everybody who can possibly tune in. So that we ran that for, we're still running it for like four years now, or five years, and it's a tiny little outlet, and it's the only, well we say we're the only free radio station in Sarawak, in that way that we don't, we have we're not, no censorship here. Because Malaysia has very stringent media laws. Um, they like this thing called sedition, which is basically don't talk bad about the government, or they will come after you with hellfire. And um, we do this all the time. Um, so they did lots of stuff as well, trying to shut the radio station down. They would set up jamming stations that would jam the shortwave signal. So we had to consistently switch our shortwave frequency around so people could still find us. The trick with that is telling people that you have a new frequency, which is really hard, especially when people live in rural communities where there's no 3G, there's nothing. So we have to do flyers and all kinds of stuff. But um, at the moment, the station is on a hiatus, but hopefully coming back soon. Because uh, the other thing as well with shortwave, it's expensive to run. You know, you need to have producers and the frequency as well. Um, other products we've done, we did some stuff where we were trying to map out uh, the corruption in Sarawak. So this is all the sort of logging going on and the illegal logging as well. This is, looks a bit ancient now, the web moves fast. Because um, now, really, especially with mapping these days, you can do things that are incredible. But the idea was to give this a visual scale of what's going on in terms of deforestation. Um, another product we did for both the 2011 and the 13 election in Malaysia, we developed this tool which allowed Malaysians to go in and basically map out corruption. So when they heard about something, they could map it on there. It was like a crowdsourced tool, um, both for mobile and desktop as well. I mean, we mapped we, lots of things. The Malaysian friends, they would get pay rises right around election time. So if you worked on a, for a state company, suddenly, like Petronas, for instance, they would all get pay rises right around election time because they were sort of their, the government's way of saying, you have to vote for us, basically. And for us, you know, for the Europeans, we are going, that's, you're totally paying people off. But the Malaysians don't always quite see it that way, so it's a lot of, to do with education as well. Um, here's another little product we did called the Baram Dam project. Um, for years, the uh, Sarawak state government wanted to build this dam in, in Baram, by the Baram River, uh, which was gonna basically flood around 30, 40 odd small villages and, and this place around 25,000 people. So we built this website where we basically animated the river and everything else and gave people a real visual idea of what the destruction would do to the area. Um, and again, all these products came off because Sarah Rocky Port was so popular. So we had an audience that we could sort of really kind of inform and kind of develop with and work something with. And we worked with other NGOs as well to get all the data. Um, moving on to, so we had the 2013 uh, election, where the Malaysians went a bit crazy against us. This is the graph, it's distorted unfortunately, of what a proper big DDoS attack looks like in pure data form. It's very daunting when you get it because everything is out of control basically. And this is just around the time when we were switching everything over to something like Cloudflare, stuff like that. But even with stuff like Cloudflare, I mean, like a, 
uh, DNS protection service. Um, you're still susceptible to quite a lot of um, attacks, and it's you feel out. Of, you feel basically you're, like you're a little bit lost because I mean, for us to get the stories out is the most important thing. And the moment we can't do that, we you know it gets tricky, and we have to move around. And if we bounce back again, the election's over. Our website goes back online. Everything is fine again because they go like we're no longer a threat to them. You know, and um, that kind of gets me to sort of the meat of the matter here because this is where things really got interesting. So two years ago, uh, Claire started, well, probably three now, started digging around about this thing called 1MDB, which is the strategic development company wholly owned by the government of Malaysia. It's basically a massive investment fund for, you know, for Malaysian money. That's gonna, they're gonna take Malaysian money, invest it outside the country, gonna generate interest, and they're gonna build it up. It's a bit like the Norwegians have the biggest um, sovereign wealth fund in the world, if I believe correctly, then followed by the Abu Dhabi. But. So the Malaysians wanted something similar. And Claire started digging around, and things just weren't adding up. And we then published some stories, and things went slightly, well, they got very interesting. Because the stories involve a guy called Jay Lowe, they installed his lifestyle, they involved the Prime Minister of Malaysia, they involved people like Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, from, it turned out that the Wolf of Wall Street film was funded by corruption, which is slightly, well, it's totally ironic. Um, and we called it the heist of the century because we're talking about two billion US dollars, which has just gone missing, basically, and siphoned off out of the Malaysians, stolen from the Malaysians. Um, so this story went up, and this is what it looked like on the site, and it did very well. Um, so well, in fact, that we just kept growing. This was supposed to be a diagram which shows you just the different flow of money, basically, that was made by some friends of ours at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, are they all working? Ah, oh, perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> so there you can see, that's a bit better. And um, that gives you an idea of just the complexity of this financial uh, arrangement and how the money flowed from different accounts and eventually ended up in Najib's own bank account, which was all the billion. And um, so these were the stories, and all the stories that come out of that is all about this diagram to some extent. You know, how did it end up there? Who was involved? How come? Um, and it, we basically continued working on this, and we ran a story on this guy who just happened to be um, quite involved with this. And I remember one day we were, we, this, the website, the story went up, and it did all right. And then one day I get a phone call going like, the story's gone. And I was like, what do you mean the story's gone? I was like, it's gone. It's literally gone from the website. And I was like, well, this is very weird, because we've had attacks before, but somebody's got into our system, and they had deleted the story really carefully, and all the images, because they were quite incriminating photographs. And we were like, okay, this is so really interesting. How do they do that? You know, who are these people? And they had masqueraded themselves very well, so we couldn't quite work out who they were. But it was just it seemed quite innocent at the time. And obviously, we recovered the story, made a big deal out of it. We go like, you know, you just dug yourself a big hole, essentially. Um, and we bounced right back. But it did make us realize that our online setup was pretty vulnerable, and we had to sort of up our game. This is what we used to look like, technically speaking. So we had a DDoS protection layer. We have content management. Now, we look like this. So we have... Uh, DDoS, we've got a web server, I need to be a bit technical now. Application server, and then we've got content management. So we're hiding the sort of vulnerable part where the content sits away from everybody. And we're also being distributed now. So we are putting articles out to various other platforms. One of, you know, which is the thing that became really interesting going forward. Because this is what the Malaysians was met with a couple of years ago now. Is that the website was now officially banned by Malaysians. So if you go on there, you, you still go on there today, you get this beautiful screen here that says basically we have broken their national laws, which they make up as they go along. Um, and we were like, okay, this is, they're no longer gonna DDoS attack us, because those days are over, we can protect against that. We're now gonna do something else. So we had to sort of rack our brains and like, how do we get around that? Because it causes all kinds of problems. One is that people have habits, the way they go online. There's the ingrained habits in how they behave, how they read, and how they look at things. So we have to sort of educate them. So one thing is that Google has no idea if your site is blocked. So somebody's Googling something, they click on the link, and they go like, oh, can't get any further. 
you know, we tried running on alternative domain names. So we, you know, I bought a ton of domain names, you know, just alternative ones and putting the site up and they would just be blocked one after the other as well. The other problem is that you can obviously use a proxy, but uh, mobile uses, you know, people using a proxy on mobile is tricky. You've got to set it up. Most people have no idea and it's too difficult. And then you could put other platforms as well, which I'll get to about Medium, for instance, is another way of doing it. And then you could also post content on Facebook, but I always have a problem with all reliance on just that one platform, even if it's the biggest one, because who knows, one day the Malaysians might turn around and just go like, we've had enough with you guys. So it's always about just trying to come up with a solution that not just one, but it's multiple. So first of all, somebody from the community, which was great, did this wonderful guide for us, which is literally how to unblock Sarah Report in five minutes. It's very nice of them, because they now started to do this to not just us, but other parallel sites as well. Um, so that we did that. Then we developed our own mirror site as well, running on Amazon's servers. I'm still slightly worried that one day they're gonna block all of Amazon Malaysia because of us, which would not be good for business, at least for Malaysian business. Uh, then we started to run ads for our mirror site on Google. So if you would Google some us on Malaysia, sorry, if you Google us in Malaysia, you'd find a link to our mirror site, which was like the best use of Google ads ever in my mind, because it made perfect sense. You know, it's a way of just gaming the system. Um, it just was very expensive. <laughs> so we could only do it for a certain amount of time. Then we had some great people from our community again, who basically developed apps for free for us, which was great, really simple, effective apps. Here are the articles. There was only ever 10 articles, um, but they worked and they're still very, very popular. And then we would also, we'd also now on Apple News, which is pretty good. And we're going to be move on to, I think, uh, Facebook Instant Articles soon. And the other thing we did, just to go back to the Medium thing, we started putting all our articles on Medium, but the Malaysians banned all of Medium after a while. But they did issue this great statement, which I think is really nice which is basically the best one is that until we receive an order from a court of competent jurisdiction, the post stays up. So you're not gonna pull out, they weren't gonna pull our content. And Medium is still banned there, which is, you know, it's quite amazing. It's really quite a reaction. Um, which is why I'm always worried about Facebook in that context. And the other thing we do is we send all our stories out by email as well, you know, so people can get the full story straight to inbox. I'm not concerned about hits, it's about getting stories out to people in this kind. Uh, and just a couple of clips of a bit of press we've had over the years. And uh, yeah, and then finally, this is what we look like today. At the moment, it's always changing. And that's it. Oh yeah, last thing here. This is um, from the Bursi demonstrations a couple of years ago where there was like 300,000 people in the streets of Kuala Lumpur demonstrating, trying to get Najib to step down because of our revelations. I thought for me, that was the best thing we've ever achieved. The idea that we got people to the streets and to wear a yellow t-shirt well as it's now i don't know if it's still illegal but it was illegal at that stage which was i just thought was such a such a thing a tiny little website a couple of stories and you end up with that you know anyway thank you thank you thank you very much christian uh it's really incredible to see what a determined group of people with journalistic DNA can do in a country like uh, Malaysia. Um, Access Now was founded uh, in response to the 2009 elections in Iran, so I am overwhelmingly excited for our next speaker, Firuza. Are you ready? Let's do it. This talk is United for Iran, Apps for All, How a Global Team is Building Civic and Civil Tech for Iranians. Can you hear me? I have a mic on. I'll wait for the PowerPoint to go on. How's everyone feeling? Jet lag? Food coma? Who was up really late last night? Um, and just to remind everybody, if you look left and right, the one in the middle cuts off the top and is a little out of focus. <clears throat> so if it's annoying, just look to the sides. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here at RightsCon with other individuals, this community of dedicated individuals working for human rights around the world and using technology for best of its potential to improve lives and enhance civil liberties.
This is Nagis Mohammadi. She's a mother of 10-year-old twins, Ali and Kiana. She's a human rights defendant, a prominent one in Iran. Because of her activism, standing up to the death penalty, and her work for political prisoners, she, was re she received a 10-year sentence. Her charge, collusion against national security. She has lived without her kids for two years. There are another 926 political prisoners in Iran's prisons right now that we have documented. Individuals who are in prison for their beliefs, for their ethnicity, for their activism. I'm gonna show you a picture that's a bit jarring. Iran, but I feel it's important to share it. Iran executes more people per capita than any other country in the world. Only second in numbers to China. International construction companies have decided not to sell cranes to Iran. They're used for public hanging. The Baha'is, the most persecuted religious group in Iran, are banned from educating their own children in, for higher education. And when they choose to have informal universities, they are arrested in mass. Their grave sites are excavated and destroyed. This is Iran, this is why we're fighting. In 2009, we saw the biggest rallies in Iran since the revolution. We also saw a violent backlash by the government. Clearly, the people of Iran want freedom and justice, and the second they had a chance, there were millions of them in the streets. And clearly, the government of Iran will do anything to hold on to power. Shortly after this day, this uprisings in Iran, I decided to organize a global day of action. And hundreds of other citizens, including Tori back there in the room, that's how I met her, um, joined in. And within three weeks, we had events in 110 cities around the world. Hundreds of, 110 cities with hundreds of thousands of individuals. And the day turned out to be the biggest day of solidarity for the people of Iran ever in history, before or since. This doesn't have volume, but essentially she goes on to talk about the only continent without a, a, a rally, Antarctica. So after this day, I decided to and start to United for Iran, people, where we work to improve civil liberties. Election. That's fine. Um, to improve civil liberties in Iran, right? And for the first few years, we did this work mostly through solidarity, amplifying the voices of those inside Iran through demonstrations, social media, and online, online campaigns. And then a few things happened. One, the movement went into a dormant phase because of the repression inside the country. And we wanted to do our work more systematically, see what was happening more systematically, and do our work more systematically. So in 2011, we launched the Iran Prison Atlas. So interactive database, our first technology solution. It's an interactive database of Iran's political prisoners, prisons, and judges. Here you can see the profile of Nagis Mohammadi, and you can see profiles of prisons and judges as well. And you can zoom out, so you can look at patterns of abuse. Which are the biggest culprits among the judges? Which ethnic or religious group are being most persecuted? Which prisons have the most mistreatments, and what are those mistreatments? Journalists, the governments, the UN, NGOs, researchers, family members with individuals uh, with loved ones in prison all use the database. And we get contacted all the time about how unique it is and people are so excited when they find it. A researcher contacted us, in fact, yesterday. Then, in our constant quest to do this work more effectively, more securely, and more efficiently, we ask ourselves a few questions. One, Mehdi, who runs the Atlas, all he does all day, every day, is research torture and executions. It's hard, dark work. And we're not gonna win just fighting back what's bad. How do we create the vision we wanna see in the world and build on that? And how do we have fun doing this work? It's important. Two. Yes, we want to defend Iran's political prisoners and human rights defenders, but how do we engage hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Iranian civil society members, individuals who are interested in engaging but not taking so much risk in areas that's of interest to them? And three, how do we do work, this work effectively when we can't go back to Iran? More than half of my staff are individuals 
who are, were, are refugees who were, who have firsthand experienced Iran's harassment, imprisonment, and even torture, right? And I myself have been called an anti-revolutionary fugitive. And I think that's a pretty badass title, so I put it on my business card. So Iran for us is a bit like Hotel California. We could go back, but likely we would not be able to leave. So we, our answer to all of these questions is technology, specifically civic mobile technology. Last year at RiceCon, I launched our Iran incubator called Iran Incubator through which we're building a dozen or so apps with communities, we're supporting communities to build a dozen or so apps, all to be used for good inside the country. <clears throat> this is Nilufar. She is a champion soccer player named as Lady Goal and captain of her soccer team. In 2015, she had plans to participate in the Asian Championship for Soccer. And her husband forbid her from going. In Iran, when you get married, you surrender your rights to your husband. Right to work, to continue education, to leave the country, to get divorced, to keep custody of your child. You have to pick between a bad marriage sometimes and your child, I cannot imagine. So we did something about that. Turns out there's an app for that. We built it through Iran Cubator. So there's an app called Hamdam, which means companionship, and it's a one-stop shop for learning about sexual health, about your legal rights, and maintaining your dignity if you're an Iranian woman. You can see you know, a menstruation calendar is part of the app. It's in, the only one in Persian. This information is still a bit taboo and hard to come by. There's a section on sexual health. This section here is on contraceptives, condoms in particular in this section. You scroll down and you see information about STDs and breast exams. And more pertinent to the conversation we're having now is this section, women's rights and marriage. I'm gonna click here on right to leave the country. And in this section, you'll learn about your rights, and here you can read sample, oops, I pressed the wrong button, back, back, back. There we go. Anyway, there's a section there where you can look, have the sample language that you can put into your marriage license, after which you keep your rights if you have that language before you get married. It's a bit of a prenup, if you will. This app was downloaded 10,000 times in three weeks. We're super excited. The whole team is really, really excited. So Hamdam is one reason we believe technology works in Iran. Here are some other reasons. One, the infrastructure exists. Half the country has smartphones, and a million new ones are being added every month. Two, the country is really young. 70% of the country is under the age of 35. I'm usually the elder in the room when I'm with my fellow Iranian activists, for real. And the country's techie by necessity. To access Facebook or Twitter, you have to use proxies. Finally, the government of Iran tries to keep its citizens back centuries, but Iranians are globally minded and democratically leaning. In case of women, for example, seven, upwards of 70% of individuals entering universities for science and technology are women. There are three million Iranian women over the age of 30 who have chosen not to get married. Divorce and white marriage or living out of wedlock is commonplace. So although we have this veneer of conservatism in Iran and oppression, there's a modern country under it waiting to shine through. And these men, these fanatics, are maybe 10% of the countries with their cronies, and they control the media, the institutions, the education. And I believe in technology because it allows the other 90% to take their country back. Where they cannot organize and assemble in the streets, they can do it online. Yet, with all of this potential, our apps have been the first apps for good inside the country. So we're learning as we go. And essentially, we're doing whatever it takes to make each app successful, from development to design to dissemination. We, same as the first group of speakers, we deeply believe in working with and not for our communities. These apps, ideally, are extension of the work already happening on the ground and empowering those doing this work to do their work more effectively. Suda John sitting here, Suda Raj, she's a fierce, an established women's rights activist has been doing this work for years, and essentially this app has been done with her, it's her idea, and we've helped her make it happen. 
helps with the sustainability of the app, with the dissemination of the app. I also want to take a moment to talk about our biggest partner in the app, the team ASL19. They built the back end of Hamdam and have so much ownership of the app. We have so blessed have you be to have you as one of our partners, our main partner. Apps are only useful if you can read them. So we try as much as we can not to have the apps in just in Persian when we have the capacity. All the apps are open source, and the ones that are sensitive get security audit, independent security audits. And then the government of Iran puts hurdles in our path. We would not expect anything less from them. In fact, if they were not doing that, we were probably doing something wrong. So we do what we can to be creative and mitigate challenges that come up. For example, we embed proxies in the apps that get blocked. Or if we think some app is going to have government individuals sitting in their offices and putting in bad data, then we make sure that if it has a geolocation feature, the inputs can be done only within a certain limited section. Apps are only useful if they're used. So dissemination and engagement is probably the biggest part of the work once the apps are launched. Did you know that there are 20 million Telegram users in Iran? That's 25% of all Telegram users. So we built Telegram bots. So if an individual wants to download, doesn't want to download the app, but wants to use the features, they still have that ability. I want to take a minute before I finish to talk about, no, actually, I'm going to say something else first. So I'm going to do my last demo, if you're ready for it. Um, 173 out of 180 is Iran's ranking for Press Freedom Index from Reporters Without Borders. We rank top six jailers of journalists since 2008. And freedom of expression is the lifeline of democracy. So the next app I'm going to talk about is essentially about freedom of expression. It's kind of like SoundCloud for Iranians. And it's a platform where individuals can have channels to broadcast what they want to share and receive content, right? And data is very expensive, phone data. So this app says, listen, on, uh, download at home, listen at, uh, at war, uh, on the go. There are five languages. Um, speaking, and, and I'm going to go through this section, which is the channels. There are uh, podcasts, audiobooks, there's news. Here I'm subscribing to BBC Persian. And this is aptly named Taboo, and it's a very popular channel, radio station, that focuses on things like female orgasm and uh, independent Kurdish state. This has been downloaded, this app, in the last five or six weeks, 5,000 times, and its stars and reviews are quite high. I think it's near five, hovering near five. And I'm happy to talk about the other apps that are down the pipeline. It's at Wrightstown anytime you like. So one of them, it's like Yelp for government accountability and transparency. Another one is for the 2.2 million drug users in Iran. And another one, what's the third one? Drug users that, I'll come back if I remember. I want to take a moment to talk about the current state of the world, in particular in my other home country, the US. <clears throat> we may have the tendency right now to want to drop everything and focus on what we feel is an assault on humanity, our environment, and our government. I argue that that's not what we should be doing. We should be fighting back and fighting back and fighting hard and fighting every day, and as if our lives depend on it, and it does, and we need to continue our fights and build the momentum that we built for decades around the world, because that matters too. What happens in Iran has global implications. We won in the US with the so-called Muslim ban because we, got, we were pissed. We were in the streets, we were at the airports, we called our congresspersons like never before, and the media is relatively independent in the US, right? And US is escalating in some ways politically with Iran, and militarily, the writing's on the wall. If there's a country that might pick, that would be it. And if we wanted to avoid that potentially, empowering Iranians so they too can express themselves and organize if they need to is critical. Iranians desperately want to be part of the global community and they desperately want peace. Also, it's not a one-way street. Iranians have unfortunately tons of experience that could be really useful in the US right now. When I first started this work, I really wasn't sure how much impact we could have. 
from outside, right? We're outside the country trying to make change. And over time, I've learned that not only can we have impact, there's certain work that we only can do from the outside because of capacity, because of capacity and security. We have documented 2,000 cases of political prisoners. It's taken us 7,000 hours. And we have a dozen apps we're building over two years, and we have secure servers that the government don't own. This work is not easy. In fact, I often go gray. I've colored it for you guys, and a lot of it is because of the fundraising work I have to do. But I'm not going to prison for this work. Not only can we have impact, I believe that we have the mandate and the moral duty to, pr to do what we can to support those inside Iran. Thank you so much. David, you are up. Thank you so much. That was like beyond even the wildest billing I could have anticipated. What a great effort. Um, next up is David McNamara from Ushahidi. Have a mic. Uh, Ushahidi is one of my favorite startups around the world. One of the most interesting conundrums is how you keep something like Ushahidi alive as a company building things for civic good. And uh, with that, over to you, David. Thanks very much. Hi guys, everyone doing well today? Um, my name's David McNamara. I'm a senior developer with Usha Hidi. Uh, Natalia Manning, our chief of operations, unfortunately can't make it today, so I'm going to talk on his behalf. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Usha Hidi is a, a crowd sourcing, crowd mapping platform where organizations can uh, collect, um, manage, visualize, and respond to data collected in, from the crowd. Um, so some examples would be uh, the Red Cross. Um, we're in Syria at the moment. We're collecting information against uh, about violence against women and children in Syria. That's our, probably our most active deployment at the moment. Uh, we're across uh, human rights, environment, uh, citizen journalism, a whole rake of uh, different, different uh, types of deployment. We have uh, over 90,000 deployments now, so all sorts of organizations, big and small, are using our software um, to solve problems and to respond to human rights violations around the world. So this is our team. There's about 25 of us. Uh, we're from all over the world, based in Nairobi, Kenya. So lots of diversity, which is great. Uh, lots of energy, um, beautiful people, smart, um, great team. Really engaged with the community. If, if, you, uh, if, if you file a support ticket, you'll get a response maybe in a couple of hours. Uh, this is us on our team retreat in Kenya about two months ago. Everyone looking mad. <laughs> so the mission statement then, our technology empowers people to raise their voices while delivering tools to help organizations better listen and respond to their constituents. So we're, we're a tech company, essentially, uh, a non-profit tech company. Uh, we don't get too much involved in the deployments itself, apart from uh, offering support and expertise. Um, as I said, 100,000 deployments all over the world, um, about 7 million reports overall. So you know, they're real people. They, they're people in distress. They're people who's, who are having their, their rights violated. Those are seven million people who want to raise their voice. So that makes you think about uh, the impact uh, software like this can have, is to allow these people maybe to, to, to talk about things they have no other way to talk about. Um, if you're an organization, you want to engage with your users. Organizations are great at sending out information, but rarely are they good at listening to their stakeholders. You want to have real-time monitoring in case uh, something's gone down on the ground. Uh, say we deployed in Nepal at the, uh, the earthquake last year, so lots of aftershocks going on. Uh, you want to really have your finger on the pulse to see where people are suffering and where to send resources. Uh, you want metrics. We, uh, 
we have map views, we have list views, we have lots of charts, uh, we have notifications. So if you're an organization, you can really feel what's happening on the ground. Uh, if you're a user of the system, um, we allow you to, to report with SMS, email, we have an app, um, different things like you can call in now. Uh, we're looking for at Facebook, um, WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, for different, uh, different markets now. So, you know, it depends uh, a lot on if the internet is, is bad in your country or perhaps it's been cut off. So we, we need to maximize the number of, of channels for those incoming reports. As an organization, um, like I said, you want to monitor what's going on the ground in real time. Uh, there, our platform combines all those different channels into a single uh, map view. You can visualize exactly what's going on. Um, so example, we just deployed in, in, in Peru. There's been loads of floods going on there. Uh, you can see right now on a map where those floods are happening, what resources people need. Um, the, um, the organization there, Emergencia de Peru, uh, they're using the software now to, to send out uh, aid and to, to manage the, I think they're using it to start to uh, manage the, the, the infrastructure being repaired now based on reports from actual real people on the ground. Uh, depending on the deployment, there are different workflows. So to use a Peru example, a workflow would be, see if a report is urgent, you might need to send out some uh, the emergency services, you might need to uh, make a note of that, you might need to translate it if it's a different language. Uh, we have workflows for uh, geolocation, uh, if, if you SMS saying, I need help, uh, we have a workflow to re reply to that and say, where are you? Um, th these are all um, part of our, th the process of um, the version three of our platform, which came out last year. So big news then, um, this year, we just released our new iOS and Android apps to the app stores about two weeks ago. So we're very excited about this. Uh, key features are being able to report offline. So if the internet goes off, if someone uh, cuts the internet in your country, you can report using the app. And when you're next online, it'll, it'll send it up to the cloud. You can now use uh, the video on your phone to uh, record something happening in real time. That's gonna stream up to our server. Uh, if you're seeing election violence uh, in Kenya, um, if you're seeing any sort of harassment going on, you can take a video and it immediately gets sent up to the cloud and it's available for everyone to see. And of course we have GPS then, of course, um, seeing as it's mobile app, we get your exact GPS location on, uh, <coughs> on each report there. This was gonna be a demo, but I don't think the video is working. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we can't see that now, but I encourage everyone to, to go and download our iOS or Android apps and give it a play. Uh, you can access all of our deployments up there. Uh, you can report and you can see maps and visualizations of all that information. So the next big thing I, I wanna talk about is roll call. Now, I think this is probably the first conference where this, uh, this new product was uh, announced we're kind of in closed beta at the moment. Roll call is basically, uh, so you know on Facebook, you can now uh, check in if there's been an emergency or a disaster or something. So we're, we're thinking that's a, Facebook's a bit of a silo. We want a, an open source product that can do the same thing. So this app will allow you to, as an organization, to check in with all your staff in a crisis zone to make sure they're okay. So to use the previous example of the ne Nepal earthquake, if you can imagine that there might be uh, more aftershocks going on. And you're in Nepal as uh, say the, uh, the Red Cross, something like that. You wanna make sure that all your staff on the ground are okay. So this app, this platform will allow these organizations to send out a roll call. 
saying, are you okay? And we'll maximize the channels. So your staff will get an SMS, an email. They might get a call. They can use the app to, uh, to report if they're okay or not. So as an organization, you can have confidence then that your staff on the ground are, are alive, are well, and can do their job. Uh, closed beta at the moment. Please talk to me if this resonates with you. We're looking for um, some, some people that are willing to take a few bugs in the system, but we want to get this out and testing because we're really excited about how this is going to change the landscape for, uh, for aid organizations. Um, that's it then. So, Ushahidi has been around for 10 years now. Um, we've got version three of the platform. We have our mobile apps, and then we have our new roll call app coming out very soon. So we're, we're active, we're engaged. We, we want to get in contact with anyone who might be a partner in any of these, people who might want to deploy our software. And we're also looking for, uh, for fundraisers. So if you have a load of cash, come talk to me. I'll find a home for it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And now from one David to the next. Uh, the answer to my question, by the way, how do you keep an organization like Ushihita Live is build awesome stuff. Those apps are all very, very cool. Uh, and now finally, um, the kind of like frontier for censorship these days is countries exporting their own censorship practices and preferences globally. And there's a incredibly, a uh, troubling new technique that's come to the fore, and David is going to tell us about it. Uh, yes, so, at, uh, so Steve and I are at uh, Electric Frontier Foundation, and we found ourselves uh, uh, sort of deep in uh, the woods with, uh, with the Republic of Kazakhstan over the past few years. And this started in the summer of 2014, where a bunch of, uh, of government email, government Gmail accounts uh, uh, were appeared on the web. Uh, shortly thereafter, an independent media organization that uh, reports on Kazakhstan, which is banned in the country, called Respublika, started publishing articles based on this archive. And then uh, shortly thereafter that, the Republic of Kazakhstan filed a lawsuit in the U.S. under U.S. anti-hacking laws. They filed it against unnamed defendants, but they used the, that lawsuit to get an order uh, ordering uh, Respublika's articles removed from the web. Uh, we then got involved, uh, because you can't do that under U.S. law, and, uh, but it took a while to actually get uh, court order, get those court orders uh, invalidated and get them clarified that they could not apply to our client who was not a defendant in the lawsuit, had not been named, and had not been proven to have done anything wrong at all. Uh, it took us another uh, year and a half to actually uh, to fight off other efforts of the public of Kazakhstan. Uh, they, they were allowed to depose our client and to ask them information about their sources. We didn't, they weren't required to answer uh, about their funding sources, about their relationships, about their history. Um, and then, and then uh, Kazakhstan also subpoenaed Facebook to try and get all the technical information about the account holders, Respublika's account holders, and we had to fight uh, and got a court to uh, order that uh, Facebook did not have to disclose IP addresses and other sensitive uh, account information. Uh, one of the things that we discovered during this time was that Respublica had been, uh, members of Respublica had been receiving uh, malicious uh, emails. And, um, and, and we started to look into this, well, to see, to see what, uh, what uh, this uh, suspicious activity was looking for, and I'll hand it over to Eva. Nothing makes me happier than when people send malware directly to us. <laughs> Hi, my name is Eva Galper, and I'm the Cybersecurity Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and mostly what I enjoy doing is uh, finding very obscure state-sponsored malware. You can think of me as sort of a state-sponsored malware hipster. Um, really only interested in countries very obscure. You've probably never heard of them. So when our client started getting uh, suspicious uh, phishing emails um, from what 
uh, they suspected was the Republic of Kazakhstan, this was right up my alley. Uh, me and my colleagues uh, did, uh, you know, basically gathered up all of the phishing emails. We uh, downloaded all of the samples of malware that they were trying to co uh, covertly install um, on our clients' computers. Uh, they did not actually succeed in installing anything on our clients' computers. Uh, we performed an analysis uh, and one of the most interesting things that came out of this was that we were able to connect it to other campaigns, uh, other phishing campaigns that had been carried out against, surprise, surprise, um, other dissidents who were in uh, legal uh, trouble uh, with the Republic of Kazakhstan. Uh, including uh, one uh, former minister who is uh, sort of now exiled, who is involved in a, in a very lengthy uh, legal battle in Switzerland, um, and his family, and his press contact, and his lawyer, and uh, a number of other dissidents as well, uh, which is one of the reasons that we came to the conclusion that, hey, perhaps this is Kazakhstan. Uh, yeah, sometimes attribution is hard, sometimes attribution is not hard. Uh, one of the other things that I went and did was I turned around and I uh, looked at the emails which had been uh, published on this website, uh, which Respublica had been reporting on, uh, in order to get some idea of, of what was going on. And these were mostly emails between um, officials from the Republic of Kazakhstan and a company called Arcanum. Uh, Arcanum is a Swiss company that had been uh, hired by the government for uh, I think like three million dollars one year and four million dollars the next year um, to do intelligence gathering um, against the people with whom they are in uh, currently in legal conflict. And that sure sounds like send our enemies malware to me. Um, however, one of the interesting things that we found in our analysis was we discovered that uh, the, the command and control servers used um, by the malware that we were able to gather had a lot of similarities to uh, another known campaign. This was called Operation Hangover, and it had been uh, report on, reported on by a security company called Norman Shark. Uh, and this particular campaign of malware had been carried out against Indian uh, sort of technology companies and uh, also some political contacts like uh, a, I think a, um, a Punjabi separatist group. So this sounded very much like a, some sort of Indian affiliated state actor. And this uh, campaign of malware was attributed to a Indian company based out of New Delhi uh, called Apin which we thought was particularly interesting. So again, attribution, sometimes hard, sometimes not so hard. Uh, we have, I think that the most likely conclusion behind all of this was we can be certain that the government of Kazakhstan paid Arcanum uh, to do something. Uh, and it is possible, though not entirely conclusive, that that something was that Arcanum turned around, went to India, and outsourced their hacking and pocketed the cash. So uh, corruption all around the world. Uh, our, the, um, our clients, our now former clients, uh, I think that our uh, sort of relationship with them does not always end at the end of, at the end of a court case, uh, have continued to be uh, targeted by these uh, state actors from Kazakhstan uh, with a variety of phishing attacks that they continue not to fall for, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, their associates uh, continue to be uh, targeted by these things as well. Uh, one of the reasons that we're particularly concerned about this is because enemies of the government of Kazakhstan have a bad habit of getting kidnapped. Um, one of the, the other things that I discovered in my research was that the family of 
um, of the former minister with, uh, who, who had also been targeted um, was, was not living with him and had changed their names and had moved to Italy and were traveling under another passport. And the government of Kazakhstan somehow uh, convinced the Italian government to extradite them back to Kazakhstan, effectively kidnapping them. Uh, and we think that they may have tracked their, uh, their movements um, by installing, by covertly installing malware on their devices, which we find extremely troubling. Um, so this is one of these really interesting cases where malware analysis, which most people think of as extremely dry, like, aha, there's a phishing email. Oh look, someone has broken into your account. Actually has a lot of very troubling real world consequences. Uh, for example, uh, kidnapping, spying, uh, the, some of the things which happened to our clients uh, in Respublica were particularly alarming. Uh, their offices uh, several years ago were firebombed. They've received death threats, uh, once nailed to a dog. Uh, the head of the dog was later sent to the, uh, to the publisher's house. So uh, malware, uh, more exciting than it sounds. Uh, we hope to be able to do more research into this in, uh, in the coming years, especially if this, uh, if this campaign continues. And I would like to encourage anybody in this room or who is, uh, who is at RightsCon uh, who is a security researcher and is interesting, uh, interested in doing threat intel to come talk to me after this. And I would also like to encourage uh, people who are in this room who are uh, human rights advocates and who receive uh, phishing emails or are otherwise targeted by malware uh, also to come talk to me because often uh, as this case illustrates um, you're not the only one and it can be really helpful to have somebody who sees the big picture and can out the entire campaign and that's one of the ways in which we can actually uh, do a lot of good but it starts with you deciding that you're going to contact someone like me and if you stay silent I cannot magically know that you have been compromised and we cannot get together and help more people and uh, really uncover what is going on. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. We have miraculously ended exactly on time. Uh, we've now got a 15-minute break. There will be more lightning talks on personal data and privacy starting at whatever hour this is, uh, 15 minutes from now. Uh, so uh, please come back. There will be more amazing lightning speakers.